Okay, let's pray then. Loving, gracious Father, once again, we so very grateful and thankful to you for uh, the many opportunities we have in being able to continue to grow in your grace and your knowledge. And today is one of those, once again, as we come together for study. And as Praveen leads us in the book of Ephesians, we ask for uh, your guidance, your help, help us to see things that we may not have seen and so that it will enrich our Christian lives. And indeed, we can be uh, a testimony for you, Father, to the, to the many who might be, might come in touch with. We ask for your blessings on this time together. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much uh, for uh, leading us in prayer. Uh, last week, we have started uh, the series on uh, Epistle to Ephesians. What we will do today is uh, we'll just uh, look at the synopsis or one or two main points that we have <coughs> discussed in the last week. Especially in the last week, we have discussed about the purpose of the epistle. What is the purpose behind writing this epistle? So we understood that... Uh, Apostle Paul wants to enrich our Christ, uh, the Christian faith, sp uh, especially to the people in the uh, church at Ephesus. It is not focused on any, any issues that are in the church, but he wanted to give them a very uh, profound and a deep theological understanding of the gospel. And he has written this letter. And throughout the letter, if you read, we will understand the purpose, what he wanted to communicate, what the main themes uh, and the main purpose behind uh, this letter uh, is very evident. Uh, the main themes that Apostle Paul wanted to teach from entire epistle are two. Number one, what is our position as members of the body of Christ? This is what he wanted to explain to us by revealing the mystery of God's purpose. God has a purpose and Apostle Paul wants to reveal that through which he wanted to explain to the church at Ephesus what is our position as members of the body of Christ. And the second thing is he encourages and challenges us and in fact commands us that we need to walk worthy of our calling as members of the body of Christ by participating in the mystery of God's purpose. He wants us to walk worthy of our calling. And how are we going to do it? We are going to do it by participating in the mystery of God's purpose. So from this, we understand that a book of Ephesians, it explains the theology of the church, which is technically called ecclesiology. And this also explains about church and the fullness of Christ in God's plan. This is what the overview and this is what the main theme of book of Ephesians. God has a purpose and we ought to know the purpose and we have to walk worthy of the worthy of our calling. How we can do that? By participating in the purpose that God has for us, which was a mystery and in which and now it has been revealed to the apostles. And the same thing, Apostle Paul, the same knowledge of the mystery he wanted to impart in each and every believer's lives. So that is what the main uh, picture we need to have as we are reading the book of uh, the epistle of uh, Ephesians. Today, what we'll try to look at chapter one. We may not, definitely we may not be able to cover everything in chapter 1, but we will look at the setup of uh, chapter 1 and we'll pick up few important themes from it. And in the days to in the following weeks and all, we will go into uh, each and every uh, uh, important themes that we can find in Ephesians chapter 1. Before that, I would like to read the chapter 1 to you. Paul an apostle, uh, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless uh, and before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he, ma which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be uh, to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased position to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks, uh, thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us we believe? No, sorry, who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, far above all principality and powers and might and dom dominion and every name that is named not only in the age, uh, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who for who fills all in all. This is Ephesians chapter 1. So it is a very familiar scripture to all of us and as we are reading itself we can find it is so very rich and there are so many themes and uh, uh, very huge theological terms which Apostle Paul used and uh, those are very rich to study and uh, some of them even beyond our uh, understanding and I do believe in them. Apostle, uh, sorry, uh, the Holy Spirit he is going to help us to understand and he will lead us into uh, the mystery and he will lead us into the whole truth as he reveals the mystery of his purpose. So if you look at this chapter one, we can divide it into three parts. First part is greetings and salutations. In the beginning, he said, Apostle Paul, uh, Paul, the Apostle of Lord Jesus Christ, according to the will of God. And he said, grace and peace to you from Father and the Son. And then, second part is talking about blessings received as member of the body of Christ. So, verse 3 onwards, he explains the kind of blessings the church and each and every one of us as members of the body of Christ have received. Let me even last week we have discussed uh, God has purpose in all of our lives. He has purpose in, in our individual lives and all our purposes will lead towards the greater purpose he has that is on the body of Christ. 
all the purposes he has in individual life should be culminated, should be contributing something towards the purpose that God has for the, for the body of Christ Jesus. That is the very reason. Even the blessings when God has blessed, uh, when God has given, he has blessed each of us individually also. And in fact, he has blessed us towards the blessing that he has, the blessings that he has in store for the body of Christ. So that's the reason I'm saying the second part can be considered as blessings received as members of the body of Christ. We are not receiving these blessings outside the body of Christ. We are receiving these as part of the body of Christ. That is something very important. Uh, Apostle Paul wanted to communicate in throughout the epistle and uh, which we will be exploring uh, in the days to come. And the third part we can see is the prayer for the church. Uh, from verses 14 onwards till the end, he prayed for the church. So there are many prayers in the Bible and especially the, the prayers Apostle Paul makes are quite interesting. And the kind of prayers he makes in book of Ephesians and as well as Colossians are a little similar. And these prayers reveal the depth of uh, the theology Apostle Paul has. I was just uh, listening to a podcast uh, from one of the uh, church fathers, uh, like, you know, a Coptic, a Coptic father was saying, uh, he was explaining about theology. And he said, the theology is not uh, a mathematical logic of finding God. It is not a mathematical logic of understanding the concept of God. The true theology is actually how much we understand that would be reflected in our prayer. If our theology is not leading us and informing our prayer, if it is not, uh, uh, what we say, influencing our prayer, then our, we are not doing theology. We got stuck at some mathematical mythology. Okay, so when we are understanding God, the understanding of God will be in, influencing our prayers. So if any time uh, you feel um, I'm, I'm having always the same words to pray, same words to pray. And let me tell you, that means we might have got stuck somewhere. We, we just need to go back to God and hello, ask him to uh, reveal himself to us again. Uh, and uh, we, we so that our prayer life may be enriched. So if our prayer being the same always means we are not growing in understanding of God. So this is my prayer again for all of us that we may go grow in our prayer and we may have constantly changing prayer. We may not get stuck at only one. But as much as we're growing in understanding of the mystery of God, our prayer life will be uh, changed and it will be enriched. So, uh, chapter 3 is of these three parts, greetings and blessings received uh, as the members of the body of Christ. And in fact, if you see uh, in chapter 1, we can see totally 10 blessings, Apostle Paul explains. And uh, these uh, three blessings are from Father, five blessings are from the Son, and two blessings are from the Holy Spirit. And the third part is prayer for the church. Uh, and we can consider them as blessings or we can consider them in this manner also. So, especially from verse 3 onwards, still uh, uh, verse 13, if you read. So, first part is about, it speaks about uh, the mystery which has been planned. The purpose or uh, the mystery has been revealed about the purpose of God and the purpose which has been planned by the Father. The same thing we're talking about, talking as blessings from the Father. And the second part is the purpose sorry, the what God has planned, it has been purposed and it has been accomplished in Christ Jesus, who is the Son of God, which we are talking about as the blessings from the Son. And the third thing is, the church is protected, uh, preserved in the Holy Spirit, which we are talking as blessings from the Holy Spirit. Okay, all these three can be considered as the blessings of God or we can consider as uh, first part talking about the plan of the Father. Second part is talking about how it has been purposed and accomplished in the Son. And the third part can be considered how it has been protected, uh, the church has been protected and uh, preserved by the Holy Spirit. 
let us look at uh, a few things uh, you know for especially the first part of uh, chapter 1 as i told you we won't be able to complete the first chapter in one session and because it is a very rich uh, uh, episode and we will come back to that but few things we will address in case we could not uh, uh, as much time permits we will go and uh, uh, the rest we will do in the coming weeks so verses 1 to 2 they say about they they are they are talking about the salutations apostle paul was addressing the church at ephesus and he uses uh, some interesting words first thing is he says paul an apostle by the will of god apostle paul considers his apostle apostleship is by the by the will of god it is not by any man's will you know even in book of uh, acts if you see uh we have 12 apostles, right? Jesus had 12 disciples. One disciple uh, lost the track and, uh, you know, you know the story very well. Then what first thing the disciples did, the 12 disciples did was they put uh, lots and they chose another person. They wanted to replace the one who was missed, that is Judas Iscariot, and they found Matthias. We can see that that, that is a human will. Apostles, they wanted Matthias, somebody to replace Judas and they wanted to find him. But in the history, if you read, nowhere we find this person. What ministry he has done, we don't know anyway. I'm not saying he has not done any ministry, and uh, but uh, we don't know what, what is. But the, I'm, I'm not saying that is against the will of God also. God's will is that we should go and preach the gospel to the other parts of the world. Okay, so there is no negative things I'm speaking about it. But one thing I can definitely tell you that uh, the Matthias was chosen by the will of humans and we could not see much uh, of his ministry. But we know the ministry what Apostle Paul has done. The Apostle whom, whom God has chosen. He's the only Apostle chosen by the resurrected Jesus. Personally, he called him. And uh, you know the kind of ministry Apostle Paul has done. Such a tremendous ministry he has done. He preached the gospel. In fact, he took the gospel to all parts of the known world of his time. Preaching and uh, preaching and sharing the gospel in front of Caesar means preaching in and sharing the gospel in front of entire Roman world, which 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 used to be the known world of those days. He has taken the gospel to entire world of his days. And the kind of rich literature he, uh, he gifted us, the epistles which we are reading, the Christianity it got, it's, uh, uh, he, he's, he, formed, he, fra he formed and he framed uh, the Christian theology, Christian understanding of the gospel also. The, his contribution was so great. And we are reading about him even after 2000 years. We are reading his literature even after 2000 years. I do believe we are going to do that till Jesus Christ is going to come back. You know the kind of ministry he has done because he is an apostle was chosen by God. And we are seeing the, the modern, uh, you know, anyone who is into ministry, they are trying to, they are taking the name apostle. Apostle so and so, apostle so and so. It has become a trend in these modern days. And in the Bible, we find even the person who was called by the resurrected Jesus and have done such a tremendous ministry, his apostleship itself was questioned in the first century. And the, uh, look at our kind of situation now. Every, you know, every person, whether they have credentials or not, whether, whether even they have calling or not also, we don't know, but they're taking the name apostle. So, uh, what, what is an apostle? Number one thing we need to understand, an apostle should be a person who is doing apostolic ministry and who, who has seen Jesus. We have we had 12 apostles. We had 12 apostles. That all, that's all. We have apostolic ministry available for us. What is apostolic ministry? Apostolic ministry is nothing but church planting ministry. The word apostle means the one who sent out, sent out on a purpose. So, the purpose they are sent out was to go build churches, uh, evangelize and build churches. So apostolic ministry can be compared with the church planting ministry. So apostolic ministry is available today, but not the apostles. Because one of the criteria for apostles is they, they should be uh, someone who has seen uh, Jesus. 
So, Apostle Paul considers himself as the Apostle according to the will of God. And uh, moving forward, and he says, to the saints and the faithful at Ephesus. Saints. Who here is in Jesus Christ is a saint. Unfortunately, some um, uh, organized uh, uh, organized Christian bodies, they have kept the sainthood only to certain people and to, uh, to limited people. But in fact, when we read in the Bible, we understand that Apostle Paul, especially he calls all the believers of Jesus Christ as saints. And uh, not just church at Ephesus, we studied church at Ephesus was one of the best churches in the early church time, uh, apostolic time. But even he uses the same word, same he addresses even the church at Corinth with the same words. He calls church at Corinth also as saints. So church at Corinth, you know the kind of problems they have. He, he Apostle called even them as saints. It is because sainthood is the work of God in us. It is not our lifestyle or our uh, uh, who we are. It is not something that we do for ourselves. It is not based on what we have accomplished and achieved. It is completely the work of God. God, God made us holy and blameless. Even if you read in chapter 1, we find, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings, just as he chose us in him to be holy and blameless. It is the Father who chose us to be holy and blameless. It is in Jesus we are made, we are justified and sanctified. And it is by the Holy Spirit, again, we are being sanctified. So it is the work of God. We are being called saints. It is the work of God. It is not any of our merit. It is God's complete grace and his work. And God sanctified us and made us holy when he united us. And made as members of the body of Christ. Whoever belongs to the body of Christ is holy. It is because we are the body of Christ and for no other reasons. First Corinthians, it might it will remind us the temple of the Lord is holy because the presence of God is in the temple. When we call we are the body of Christ, the presence of Christ is in us. That makes us holy and nothing else. Not any of our efforts. And the, the same thing Apostle Paul explains in a great deal in chapter 5. So we are made saints by the work of God. We are sanctified and made holy when we are united with God. Okay, And we are made holy by the adoption in the Son. Saint also which means making holy means set apart. God has set us apart in Jesus Christ. God has chosen us in him. In Christ, God set us apart. That is what making us holy. So, sainthood is the work of God. It's the work of the Father, work in the Son. And sainthood is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We ought to work with him. It is the Holy Spirit who is working in us. To may to and sanctifying is uh, sanctifying us, uh, uh, sanctifying us every day. So the sanctification has two uh, two facets. One is it has been already done in Jesus Christ, and each and every moment in the Spirit we are being sanctified in our experience. That's why Apostle Paul uh, Peter writes in First Peter chapter one verse one to two, to God. So to God select, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So, we became holy and we have, our sainthood is the work of the Father, it's the work of the Son, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And next thing he mentions is faithful in Christ Jesus. So, he, he uses this word for two purposes. Number one, uh, he was encouraging, sorry, he was um, uh, appreciating the faithfulness of the church at Ephesus. 
okay because church at ephesus is known for their faithfulness we all know we read book of uh, revelation chapter 2 where the good qualities of church of church at ephesus were explained and so he was encouraging them and uh, uh, sorry appreciating them and then he is also challenging them to continue to be faithful that is the reason he used this word so he called the believers at ephesus as saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. So that's how he uh, addressed uh, the church at Ephesus. So what I will do now is uh, we will I will share with you the second part of it. Uh, it is just like an overview and which we will study in, in detail in the week in the coming weeks. So as we said uh, the second part of uh, so entire in the in these three parts, of chapter one, second part is talking uh, about the blessings we received as the body of Christ, okay, or the purpose of God, which has been explained uh, as the plan of the Father, purpose and accomplishment, purpose and accomplished in the Son, and then protected and preserved in the Holy Spirit. In those manner, I one of the titles we can take. So we will take uh, how it has been planned, purposed, and then protected. So, from verses 3 onwards till 13, if you look at, uh, we find how God created his created the body of Christ. That's what we find throughout uh, from all these verses. Okay. So, verses 3 to 6, it speaks about, uh, it, uh, it says like, you know, it was wrought and planned by the Father even before the foundation of the world. Church was wrought and planned by the Father. That's why we called it as planned by the Father. He, it, it, that's why it is written, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing and the continuation it goes. Uh, and what is the work that our Father has done? What is the plan He made and what He has done in uh, fulfilling this purpose? As we, uh, first thing we can see is, He blessed us with all the spiritual blessings. He chose us, number two, to be holy and blameless before him. Number three, he predestined us to, to be his children in love. And he adopted us. We are adopted to whom? We are adopted. We are adopted to the Father. That's why whoever believe in him, he had given the right to become the children of God. We call the Father as Abba Father. Because in Christ, we were adopted. So, God the Father adopted us. And God the Father, He accepted us. So, these are the blessings He had given to us. These are five. He blessed us. He chose us. He adopted us. And He accepted us. As part of the planning by the Father. Second thing, second part is, blessings received by the Son or from the Son. Or we can call uh, purpose and how the church, the purpose of God was accomplished in Jesus. God has purpose for the church and how it has been accomplished in Jesus. And that we can see from verses 7 to 12. Here we can, say, we can find church was bought and purchased by the son, by his precious blood. And he redeemed us. Who? Jesus. Jesus redeemed us. Jesus forgave us. He revealed God's will and way to us. This is what we find in a verse of between 7 to 12. And he secured for us an inheritance in the heavenly places. And he gathers all things in the fullness of time. All these things are accomplished and are going to be accomplished in Jesus only. So he bought us with a price, he bought or purchased us with a price. He redeemed us, he forgave us, he revealed God's will and way to us and he secured for us an inheritance and he gathers all things in the fullness of time. And let us see what God has done to us through the Holy Spirit. Verses 13 and 14. Through the Holy Spirit, he taught and protected us by the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to teach and to protect here. So, 
well, we can find a word in the uh, uh, verse 13 that we can see. He sealed us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to say that we are being sealed by the Holy Spirit? Number one is we are owned by the Holy Spirit. On whomever we have the stamp that, that belongs to the person uh, who, I mean, to whom the stamp belongs. So we all are owned by the Holy Spirit. We are owned by God. We are not of ourselves. We are purchased by His precious blood, and we do. We are not of ourselves. We are, uh, we are, we we belong to God. And number two is, we are secured by the Holy Spirit. See, anywhere, government and all, if they want to seize any property or anything, they put a seal. The moment seal is put, nobody can break it. It is secured. That's why when Jesus died and he was buried on to, on the tomb, Caesar's seal, seal was there. And Jesus broke it. Because when the seal is there, it is owned by the Caesar. So Jesus broke it through his resurrection. It was secured by Caesar. That's why nobody can attack and open the uh, uh, tomb. But Jesus, he opened it and broke down the power of Caesar altogether. So the seal reminds us about uh, uh, ownership of God and security. And then it is a complete transaction. When we go and do purchase something, we do the, we get the bill, and then what they do? They put a stamp that says the transaction is complete. So our we being the prop, uh, property of God, we are owned by God, and it has this transaction has been completed by the seal of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the seal means. So Holy Spirit sealed us. Number two, we can find is. Uh, we, Holy Spirit is our earnest now. He's like the down payment for the future uh, life, future glory that we are going to receive. We are being part of, we are made qualified to partake in the life of God. And we are, we are promised for eternal life. And now Holy Spirit, He sealed us and God, Holy Spirit resides in us as our earnest, like our down payment or the security deposit for our salvation. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit towards the church. So uh, we can find uh, the blessings received from the Father as the member of the body of Christ from verse 3 to 6. Blessings received from the Son from 7 to 12. Blessings received from the Holy Spirit from verses 13 to 14. And the rest 15 to 23 we can find a prayer. We'll discuss more about them in the days to in the days to come. But I would like to bring before you a few questions. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a statement and then a few questions uh, for our discussion. So throughout this study, especially reading from Ephesians chapter one, uh, we, we if you read or if you see also, I was bringing continuously three, uh, continuously this particular theme. Number one, it has been done by the Father, it has been done by the by the Son, and it has been done by the Holy Spirit. From which we understand that church is a Trinitarian plan of God. The plan God has for the church or the purpose he has for the church is a Trinitarian purpose. If you look at church as a body of Christ, as an institution, then you can consider even, I don't know if you can help me out if I'm using the word right or wrong in the discussion, you help me. Church is an enterprise of the Trinitarian God. It's a Trinitarian enterprise of God. It's a Trinitarian plan, it's a Trinitarian purpose, it's a Trinitarian enterprise of God. So that's what we can find if you read the first chapter of book of Ephesians. We'll go into the other themes uh, in the days to come, but this is the overall theme we can find. Church is a Trinitarian plan, purpose or enterprise of God. The uh, two questions I would like to leave uh, for our discussion. Number one is this. What happens... If the church forgets the Trinitarian vision, what happens if the church forgets the Trinitarian vision? And second question is, how this Trinitarian vision influences the present function of the church? We can consider about our church only. How this Trinitarian vision is going to influence our church today? 
So let me repeat the questions again. What happens if the church forgets the Trinitarian vision? Number two, how this Trinitarian vision influences the present, present function of the church? And, uh, and you are free to speak. And the floor is open for discussions. For any questions, thoughts, or uh, com comments, please feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, yes, sir. Surya Murthy, sir. See, we are frequently hearing about the spiritual blessings. Number one. And number two. We are frequently hearing about the blessings in the heavenly places. So how do we experience this? What is this spiritual blessings? I guess what for, are these heavenly places? Uh, I appreciate that uh, question, sir. I guess for that you need to attend our next uh, next Bible study. Next week <laughs> Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are going to discuss that only. <laughs> yes, sir. Anil, sir. What exactly do you mean by uh, saying that a Trinitarian vision or the Trinitarian enterprise, is it more than God, the whole uh, the Father, the Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is it more than that? Or basically means, yes, our belief in these three is what the Trinitarian vision is. Uh, what I meant to say is it is a complete work of the Holy Spirit, each, uh, sorry, complete work of the Trinitarian God, Father, mm -hmm. Son, and the Holy Spirit. What happens to us most of the times mm -hmm. is the moment we think about the spiritual spirituality or the church, um, though we believe in Trinity, in most of our worship, we will be doing Unitarian worship. You know, mm -hmm. we have a God in heaven and we will be doing and uh, believing things about that God. But we have we ever thought, uh, you know, how this we, we came to understand God is Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And have we ever thought like, you know, how these three are going to work together? So what happens is when we understand how these three are going to work together, it helps us to work like them or like him. In fact, that's the word, three, like three of them. So when we talk about the church, uh, you, you all know this is a very common belief in many of uh, Christians. They say father is someone who created and his work is done and he left. Son is someone mm -hmm. who came to redeem us and his work is done. Now he left. Now the Holy Spirit is working here. Once this work is done, he also leaves. Okay. So, so uh, he leaves us, basically. That's what we mean. So basically what happens is, uh, though we are believing the doctrine of Trinity, but we are not able to bring it into our worship, into our understanding. So here you and I are saved. We are saved because of these three persons of the Trinity work together. So that's what, uh, that's what we are going to that's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Surya Marthi, sir. Vision means we see into the future and try to, try to organize ourselves or evaluate something. So, what do you now mean by this vision? What is this vision? Yeah, vision doesn't need to be always about futuristic only, sir. We are living in a dark room and a light shines. That is that provides the vision to us. Vision helps us to see and uh, yeah, helps us and encourages us to work in the present, not in the future. So, what am I trying to say is where the light of God, the Trinitarian life of God, Trinitarian work of God is a light and which it which has been shown in our room now. So, how are we going to function today? Now we got the light. That's what I meant to say. So why, so why to use the word vision and? Uh... Uh, vision is a word, the, the the reason I use the word vision because it is opening our eyes to see the mystery. That's why we call it vision. I called it vision. It's not like a, oh, I have a vision for the next five years or ten years. That's not uh, the sense I'm explaining. 
it is like a light in our room and which makes everything clear so what are we going to do Any comments? Anything you would like to add? Yes, uncle. Please unmute yourself. Mr. Franklin, please unmute yourself. Now, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Sir, um, uh, uh, some denominations uh, use the word saints wrongly. Uh, today, this particular denomination or board or the church can correct itself. No, sir, why are they not correcting their errors? Oh, you you have to answer. Uh, why could uh, WCG correct it itself? You know the same thing is missing there. <laughs> the courage, you know. Uh, especially I do believe in a lot of people they are not ready for correction because they don't have the courage to come forward and say uh, we were wrong. And uh, maybe one one personal experience I'll tell you. I was uh, working as an academic dean in Goa in a Bible uh, Bible college, and uh, when I just told them I'm moving to Hyderabad, and uh, my uh, principal he asked me uh, to be uh, which group are you going to? I said I'm going to uh, GC, which used to be called WCG. And uh, I know I thought uh, WCG was a cult <laughs> in the church history. Uh, so he very badly, uh, sorry, discouraged me. Please don't go there. You are an young man. Uh, you won't have people. Other other groups may not uh, accept you if you say that you are going. You are you are going to be with WCG and all. Then I was little disturbed. I had gone through the story, our story, like in the website, it was there. Then I was convinced in my heart, if I don't stand with these people who had the courage, intellectual honesty, to say that we were wrong and we change and accept the truth. And we are not standing with them. That is not uh, we are uh, not going to them. Is not about I am not standing with them. I am not going to the, uh, going there, which tells us I am not ready to be honest intellectually. I am not ready to stand with the truth. So we need the courage to accept our mistake. So I do believe. Uh, a uh, lot of people they may have the other reasons also but definitely uh what all we lost as a church when we changed from wcg to gci all those fears only were <laughs> troubling them to accept it thank you thank you praveen sir uh, well answered intellectual honesty and courage <laughs> I just wanted to uh, just bring some reflection on that first question you asked. Uh, if the church forgets the Trinitarian vision, what happens? Uh, there is a, something called separation theology, where uh, people tend to think that what Jesus did was... Uh, you know, different from what the father wanted to do. The father is full of wrath and full of anger on sin and he wants to destroy the world. But Jesus came and said, no, 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 father, I'll, I'll sort of uh, stand in, you know, stand. Uh, uh, you can pour your wrath on me. And uh, so they separate the father and Christ, Jesus Christ. And they think that Christ appeased the Father so that the wrath of God then now is turned away from humans. And I think uh, uh, we, bring a, we bring a split between the Father and the Son. And we tend to think the Father is a very angry God, while Jesus is a, is a very nice God. And, you know, he sort of patched up uh, this problem. And so um, uh, I think that is, uh, uh, that is actually a heresy because I think Paul himself says that the father was with Jesus while he was being crucified. In other words, there was absolutely no separation between father and son. 
uh, the father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So um, we have to be careful we don't bring that divide between father and son uh, and bring a split in the Trinity. I think that is something uh, uh, if we forget the Trinitarian view, just to use another word rather than vision <laughs> or the Trinitarian uh, reality, uh, we have to be careful that we don't bring that divide. Does it make sense? Uh, <laughs> Any more comments? Yeah, I'd like to add one to the first question. What happens when uh, people do not, uh, rather the members of the body of Christ do not uh, believe in the Trinity and uh, in the in the way that they function together as as a team. Um, as uh, Pastor Dan said, one is that uh, you know what the reason that he gave. The other one that, that could happen rather, but um, the other reason also what would what could happen? Not reason. The other effect that could happen when people of the body of Christ do not believe in the Trinity or take it as a team working together uh, could also be then that there is no, um, uh, there is no, rather there comes a divide between what is physical reality of life and what is spiritual. So it would, because this, the Lord say uh, in within the Trinity, we know it is the Holy Spirit that helps us on a day to day basis, right? Because he is with us, that the spirit, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit isn't given to us. So when we believe in the Trinity, it becomes a realistic way of life. The spirit working within us for us as we uh, uh, believe in the in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So there is a continuous realistic life, practical life that's happening there. But the minute we divide the Trinity as saying only as the Father and the Spirit and do not believe in the Trinity, it becomes more like this. Har Sunday jao, ganti bajao, coconut khodo. You know, it becomes there's suddenly a divide. There is no realistic uh, approach there anymore. It kind of makes it a divide as something this is spiritual. And so this we ought to do. And that's it. But as a team, what the Trinity do is, but they set up an example of how practical life is within themselves. And they become such a huge role model for us to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Where they, you know, when people do not believe in the Trinity, then you know it causes all kinds of there, there is separation. What the what Jesus gave his life for, we kind of automatically bring that divide in back again. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. I appreciate uh, your thought, um, Shanti. We feel me if you lose this Trinitarian vision or view, uh, it brings divide. In fact, uh, uh, the thought I wanted to answer share for the questions is. Uh, with uh, starts from I mean based on what Shanti has just said now just look at the denominations we have in the church all these denominations are created just because each denomination was focusing one as one side of uh, God only some denominations were focusing only on father some denominations focusing only on the son some denominations were focusing on the Holy Spirit only because they are focusing only on one, they, 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 we have all these sorts of divide, in fact. Somebody said uh, Anglicans and uh, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, they have to learn about the Son and the Holy Spirit from Baptist and the Pentecostal. And Baptist people should learn about the Father from Anglicans and, uh, uh, you know, Lutherans. And Pentecostal people should learn about the Father and the Son from Baptist as well as from the Lutherans. Lutherans should learn about the Holy Spirit from the Pentecostal. So we need to learn from each other. We are, The moment we, we believe in these three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we won't have these many de denominations divided, but all come together. We are working together. Even uh, I, I remember sometimes a couple of people who came to church and said, your church doesn't have a Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, because their focus is only on one person. 
our, our focus should be on Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we come together, even as the scripture says, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the right words, if you can help me out. The the three-leg thing will be very strong, like, you know, if in Ecclesiastes will find. When the third leg joins, it will become strong. When two are there, there won't be any stability. So when Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come, stability, unity, oneness comes to the church. If we divide our focus on only one, it brings denominations and divisions. So uh, that's one of the problems we face if we lose uh, the vision. Please, please, Anil, sir. No, where, whereas, of course, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a reality and is the foundation of our faith, it is still very difficult for uh, really to understand this concept. How is it three in one, one in three? And that is, I, I, I have talked to so many people, and one of the main obstacles is this: that how can you believe in three gods? You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's only one God, so it is very difficult, and and it is difficult to explain. You know, it's not easy. That concept is really not easy, and I don't think even we fully understand how this reality really exists and works. So that is one of the main problems. Why, you know, you know, some people just believe in the God, some people believe in Price and so on. Yes, sir, that is true. Yes, Bertie. <clears throat> I have uh, seen, uh, uh, like, it's a, I could say it's more rare. Uh, people, either in their, you know, in their purse or by way of any, some other gadget, holding a picture of Jesus Christ, you know, having a picture of Jesus Christ. No, I, I uh, maybe uh, they just can't do with uh, you know without that or not me. I'm talking about uh, there are cases even in the church that you just happen to see a picture. You know they hold a picture in their you know in their in their pocket or in their in their wallets. And uh, I mean, uh, why are they doing that? I mean, are they having a difficulty? Maybe, uh, maybe uh, new to the faith, uh, maybe, uh, maybe still raw in the faith. Uh, but uh, why do they need to hold that? You know, when when we 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 don't need to have any picture. We believe in the Trinity, and we believe in its working as uh, <coughs> foundation to us. And as we, as you rightly say, you know, we God opens our hearts. We uh, we are given light, and we are growing. You know? Uh, in the in the trinitarian god uh, through christ uh, all that is wonderful you know but why this picture that some people uh, have uh, could you just mention something about it uh, what i can say is pastor dan the other day he dealt with icono iconography about it i guess that would be a kind of uh, help number one and number two is it's a very deep uh, both spiritual as well as psychological issue for humans uh, for for humans to worship a god who doesn't have uh, a shape or a picture or an image uh, you know if uh, you know if possible i will definitely talk about uh, uh, images as well as icons bible uses the word icon it doesn't use the word image so i'll explain about them maybe uh, as soon as possible i'll take a break and separately i'll talk about it but the comments pastor dan made on iconography may be some kind of help uh, in for this question don't misunderstand me i'm not encouraging anything oh, oh definitely not definitely it's a very genuine question and a good question just mentioning about somebody else uh, and uh, i know. understand i understand but even many preachers unknowingly they encourage people to uh, just to imagine the picture of jesus or imagine the cross and as you are praying uh, these kind of things so what not a uh, lot of things are coming up i do believe uh, like when we uh, discuss this particular topic in detail that will be helpful rather than making some comments which may not uh, uh, provide a proper direction uh, direction to us so it's a very deep uh, and profound uh, topic uh, it, as I said, it has both um, uh, philosophy, psychology, as well as spirituality included in this. So we have to seriously study about it. We'll do that in the days to come. Thank you. Uh, Praveen, can I add one more? Yes, please. Um, there was this, uh, this comes from a personal testimony. Uh, there was a time when we went out for a missional Sunday. 
and uh, the one question a very interesting question that uh, the 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 uh, another person from another faith asked when we were talking about uh, you know we are one in the spirit and body and you know we were talking about that the you know being one uh, we are one in body one in spirit and so they he came i think he was a little bit more of an intellectual so he came up and he asked how can you say this because he told me some of you believe in there is only the father and the son some of you believe that there is spirit also there some of you believe that it is it is his spirit and not the spirit that it is that you talking about as a separate entity and uh, so uh, you know it's very difficult for me to take you at your word when you say uh, we are one in the body and spirit or when you say that all all of us we believe in you know you are just like us basically what he was trying to do is he was trying to identify himself with the remainder of the hindus because they also have slight differences and uh, uh, you know in their godly beliefs and uh, and so he was trying to say well you are the same like us so what difference what why should i just you know so if we were a uh, uh, people of god if we were people of god who would were uh, who would understand the reality teaches us you know the way of life that the that uh, the, the the lord talks about through the bible i believe that we would be more effective in our missions too you know that is why also i wonder why we are only 2% we continue to remain at 2% or something like that in india but if we were all would understand this uh, you know this uh, or rather if we would if we were to enlighten ourselves you know how the lord revealed himself through the trinity then i believe uh, you know we would be much further effective in missions in evangelizing better thanks for the thought shant yes uh, mrs rekha yes i just want to say that uh, we believe in the trinity while hinduism believes in the triad brahma vishnu and mahesh and they believe that that's one god who keeps uh, coming in different forms incarnated so there's a lot of difference between that they cannot understand the trinity where work is done in a corporate way so that is a problem in in many parts but what we can say is basically that you cannot love anyone you have to have a person you can love so that can help when you say talk about love more than anything else because the, yeah we, if there is nobody how will they love so that is the only way i, I we can explain that so tr triad and trinity are two different things but they believe in that too yeah it's wonderful uh, you pointed uh, you know the love is something that helps people to understand even uh, trinity when we talk about yeah. uh, so definitely that's that's such a beautiful thing uh, we should be focusing on that and, and uh, yeah it is true that people have uh, confusions and questions about uh, this oneness and threeness and either they take it mathematical or philosophical or uh, cosmological kind of perspective about this oneness and threeness and they do all this but they forget to uh, do uh, uh, look at these two subjectly relationally relational oneness relational three uh, you you i mean oneness and uh, plural singularity and plurality in relationship i guess uh, uh, that is the unique thing that we christians have when we talk about the doctrine of trinity uh, and as you very nicely pointed love that is something that's a key to which helps us to understand uh, these these things uh, perhaps we can discuss more about these things uh, later because these are so rich and deep things with their deep topics and i don't think that just a few comments would make justice and uh, we, we we that's what we are going to explore throughout our lives as we are living on this earth so it's already we passed the time uh so throughout this um, discussion and the, through the questions i wanted to bring only one point uh, sorry two points to an, uh, our understanding number one is church is the trinitarian work of god number two the moment we have the trinitarian vision in the church it church unites church comes together it becomes relational 
and it will not divide. So this is the theme I wanted to develop through my presentation up from Ephesians chapter one. So it's already 7.32 now. Uh, may I request Manova to lead us in prayer so that we can conclude? Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing us together for another Bible study to explore more and to learn more about you and the purpose why you have chosen us, Lord Master. There is nothing uh, worthy to count on each, any one of us, Lord Master. We all fall short of your glory. But out of your abundance, love and grace, Lord Master, you have blessed us. As you have taught us, Lord Master, you have chosen and predestined us, Lord Master. You adopted us and redeemed us, Lord Master. Help us to experience that life on this earth, Lord Master, as we're going to dwell and learn more about you, Lord Master. Help us to acquire the knowledge, Lord Master. Give, give us your grace so that we can understand and see you uh, uh, what as we learn more about you, Lord Master. And give us the strength and courage to be a blessing in this uh, community, Lord Master, so that we can be a blessing wherever we are, Lord Master. We want to pray and bless each one of the members who are able to join and learn about you, Lord Master. We also pull people who have the desire but could not make it uh, because of their commitments. We pray that you open the doors uh, for our church members especially so that they can also uh, be a part of this uh, uh, and get enriched and get blessed out of this, Lord Master. We want to thank you uh, for our pastors who are taking time uh, to teach us about your ways, about your love, Lord Master. Give them the wisdom uh, that they need so that they can teach us, Lord Master. Submitting each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.